Hello and welcome to Newsline. I'm Caitlin Cassidy. And I'm Elsie Lange. Coming up today, tech giants hit back at a new media code aimed at digital platforms. A leading advocacy group says that migrants across Australia are in need of more support than ever thanks to the coronavirus pandemic. Voters across the state will start sending in their postal ballots this week for this year's local government elections and lockdown Victorians turn to roller skating to pass the time. And of course, our daily updates across sport, finance and weather. But first, today's headlines. Victoria has recorded 12 new coronavirus cases and one death overnight. The 14-day rolling average is now up to 10.4 in metropolitan Melbourne. Cases with an unknown source have also risen to 13, two more than yesterday. Premier Daniel Andrews said the government won't ease all restrictions hoped for this Sunday, but other changes could be made outside of the roadmap. He said the changes would focus on social rather than business settings. Less than 5% of fines handed out for breaching Victoria's coronavirus lockdown restrictions have been paid. Data from Fines Victoria shows that over 19,000 fines have been issued, totalling nearly $28 million, with only 845 of those fines paid in full. Crime statistics agency data revealed more than 65% of those given fines during Victoria's first wave had criminal records. Experts have accused the federal government of ignoring the science about the risk of COVID-19 spreading through the air. Medicos say the federal government's refusal to acknowledge that the virus is airborne puts healthcare workers' lives at risk and does not align with scientific evidence. More than 3,500 healthcare workers in Victoria have tested positive to coronavirus. Cardinal George Pell has met with the Pope Francis for the first time since Pell's abuse acquittal. The Vatican has given no official details. However, the meeting went very well, according to Cardinal Pell. Pell returned to Rome in late September, months after his conviction was overturned. New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian has resisted calls for her to resign after revelation she maintained a secret relationship with disgraced former Wagga Wagga MP Daryl Maguire. Following her appearance before the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption yesterday, she said she hadn't done anything wrong, despite telling Mr Maguire she didn't want to know his dealings. Daryl Maguire resigned in 2018 after admitting to seeking a kickback over a property deal. Australia Post is under fire again after revelations that the organisation's boss, Christine Holgate, hired a $3,000 a day reputation management firm while seeking to wind back mail delivery services and win political influence during the pandemic. The bill totaled more than $119,000 as the company hired leading public relations consultant Ross Thornton for just 38 days between June and July. Ms Holgate also spent about $3,000 on corporate credit cards and chauffeur-driven cars over a 12-month period. In a huge blow to the coal industry, insider sources are reporting Beijing has given verbal notice to several state-owned steelmakers and power plants to halt imports with Australia. The coal industry is already staring down the barrel of a $17 billion export collapse due to the coronavirus-induced recession and the shift to gas power. Trade Minister Simon Birmingham said the government had reached out to China for confirmation of the reports. The move comes amid rising diplomatic tensions between Australia and China. And Australia ranks near the top of a new index measuring risk to biodiversity and ecosystem collapse. A staggering one-fifth of the world's countries are at risk because of destruction of wildlife and habitats, according to major global insurance company Swiss Re. The report says $42 trillion, more than half of the global GDP, depends on well-functioning biodiversity. Now to our first story. Tech giants are heading back with a new media code proposed by a competition watchdog, the ACCC. The new code would alter existing legislation to address bargaining power imbalances between digital platforms and Australian news organisations. May Bannister with more. Google users in Australia might have noticed a new addition to their search pages. An open letter from Google to Australians outlines the company's opposition to a proposed news media bargaining code that Google says would affect how Australians use its services. This is no laughing matter. And Facebook, 
which would also be required to pay news organisations for content under the proposed code, argues it does not take into account the billions of clicks Facebook sends to news websites, which can then be leveraged for advertising. While the proposed code has been welcomed by news organisations across the country, tech giants are not so happy about it. Google has loudly stated their disagreement, particularly with the remuneration aspects of the code. And, given it will set a precedent for the way Google interacts with media organisations in other countries, some experts say its opposition is warranted. We've got some other countries that have um, similar legal structures, similar ways of thinking about how we regulate media. And, you know, regulators talk to each other and they're, they're keeping an eye on what's happening in Australia. Once you take into account comparable developments in places like France, who are also trying to get platforms to pay for news, you start to see um, the threat, you know, of a global push towards trying to get back some value from platforms and giving that to newspapers or other media outlets. But Labor Shadow Communications Minister Michelle Rowland says the code has been born from a rigorous process of evaluation by the ACCC. Australia is long overdue for its regulatory framework to be revamped to actually reflect not only what is going on in this sector, but also set directions to have a viable media sector in the future. The ACCC is now in the final stages of preparing the code, which will then go to Parliament to legislate. And it's clear everyone will be watching. Maeve Bannister, Newsline. Maeve Bannister with that report there. Former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd is petitioning the federal government to undertake a royal commission into Rupert Murdoch's media monopoly. Let's take a look. I'm officially launching an official petition to the Australian Parliament calling on the Parliament to establish a royal commission into the abuse of media monopoly in Australia, in particular by the Murdoch media, and to make recommendations to maximise media diversity ownership for the future lifeblood of our democratic system. Jake Pike joins us now with Dennis Muller, the Senior Research Fellow at the University of Melbourne Centre for Advancing Journalism. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for joining me, Dennis. Pleasure, Jake. Uh, there seems to be some misinformation about the purpose and possible outcomes of a Royal Commission. Could you clarify the scope of a Royal Commission and what it is actually likely to achieve? Well, based on what Kevin Rudd has said, he's looking for a Royal Commission into two things. Firstly, into the what he calls the abuse of power by the Murdoch media. And secondly, into the question of media ownership diversity in Australia. So there are two prongs to it. Now, it seems to me that the first one, the scrutiny of Murdoch and his use of his very great power, he owns or controls about two thirds of the capital city daily circulation. Uh, the scrutiny of that power would be very useful because we've seen processions of prime ministers for 30 years paying court to Murdoch. Uh, and so we, it would be good to know what sort of deals get done and what sort of promises get made and what are the dynamics, what are the entrails of these exchanges? That would be very useful to know because it would tell us something we don't know about the workings of Australian democracy. On the second point, though, on the question of diversity, uh, I think that will be very difficult. Uh, history tells us that efforts to increase media diversity, not just in Australia, but in Britain too, are always doomed to fail because the politicians are frankly too frightened to do anything about it. We mentioned that uh, Rudd claims that News Corp controls about 70% of Australia's print readership. How does such a monopoly pose a threat to democracy and free press in this country? Well, it doesn't pose a, a, a threat to the free press, but it does pose a threat to democracy because of the power that that amount of control brings. We have seen it demonstrated time without number um, Prime Ministers going right back to Bob Hawke have publicly and openly paid court to Rupert Murdoch because they think that unless they have him on board, they probably can't win an election. Is 
a serious limitation on our democracy when you consider that Murdoch himself is not elected, but he exerts so much power that it's intimidating on those who are. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us today, Dennis. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you on. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you, Jake. And back to you now, Caitlin. Thanks to Dennis Muller for joining us and our reporter, Jake Pike, for that story there. Now, while many businesses have experienced a downturn during the pandemic, many community organisations are busier than ever. A lack of community support for Australia's migrant community is threatening their well-being and pushing support organisations to their limit. Reporter Oliver Lees has the story. While most Victorians work from home, the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre is taken to the streets. Over 90% of people who are accessing emergency food have no income because they're either ineligible for government support or they lost their job during COVID. So it just highlights how much of a challenge it has been for COVID. It's no exaggeration to say the impact of COVID-19 has been catastrophic, not only on the organisation, but also on people seeking asylum. For non-residents in Australia, the coronavirus pandemic has created a perfect storm, high rates of unemployment with no access to government support. A survey of over 6,000 migrant workers found 70% of respondents had lost their job during the pandemic. From the federal government, the message has always been clear. If you're a visitor in this country, um, it is time, as it has been now for some while, and I know many visitors have, to make your way home. Australia is home to over one million migrants. And for some, heading home isn't as simple as it sounds. People had maybe been living in Australia for you know, several years. They had ties. They had, you know, up to recently jobs, homes, families. That's not something that you can uproot quickly. Without federal support, community organisations have taken it upon themselves to fill the gaps. During the strict lockdown of the Fitzroy Towers, Sikh Volunteers Australia delivered hot meals to apartment buildings, and the ASRC is doing their best too, attempting to meet a fourfold increase in demand by creating a home delivery service. But even the charities themselves are not immune to hardship. We didn't have volunteers coming on site, so effectively we lost the majority of our workforce overnight. Here at St Peter's Eastern Hill Church, volunteers have started providing meals to the many struggling international students in Melbourne CBD. But these acts of kindness can only go so far. So the solution's really simple. It would be extending job seeker and job keeper to people seeking asylum and making sure that anyone in our community who needs access to a safety net receives it regardless of what visa type they're on. In Victoria, temporary migrants can now claim a one-off payment of $800. But with lockdowns stretching on for months, the future remains uncertain for those outside the system. Reporting for RMIT Newsline, I'm Oliver Lees. Thank you to Oliver for that story. And now to a quick break.
Welcome back to Newsline. Now, Melbournians have been flocking to parks since lockdown restrictions eased a few weeks ago, but can our public spaces keep up with the heightened demand? And with the council elections coming up, are there enough public spaces to cope? Now, Elsie, you're Brunswick based. What have you observed in your like, local area? Yeah, Caitlin, I am. And I'm seeing more people out and about than ever before and it's because I think they're craving access to parkland and green space while the rest of our lives are rather isolated. So it's a really important part of keeping people healthy during lockdown both physically and mentally and I think we've got to start thinking about if we're spending more time outside what is it going to mean for the environment and how can we make sure these spaces are kept hygienic? Exactly. And since it is clearly part and parcel of our coronavirus strategy now, we are starting to see with these huge amounts of people in public spaces that there might be not enough bins or not enough public toilets. They're overflowing and you've got these huge lines, particularly for mm. women. And I suppose what extra resources do we now need since being outside is going to be increasingly common? And on the other side of things, what about people that don't have this access to free and open green space in certain areas in Melbourne? that's been the case. Yeah, well, I think we're going to see a huge rise in demand for things like port and other sorts of hygienic places that you'd go to sort of just exist in a certain area. But I think also just because there's not been uh, access to certain areas like golf courses before or different parklands, people are really enjoying maybe because of certain sports being off, being able to be in those spaces and enjoy them. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important that if they're being enjoyed, they also have to be looked after and that's a whole new uh, can of worms that governments and councils are going to have to look into. Mm, and it does seem that this outdoor space is going to be key for our socialisation until we get a vaccine. So it will be interesting to see how our government and our council is envisioning these spaces in the future. So then looking forward to this year's council elections, voters across Australia have started sending out their postal ballots in the state's first election by mail. But for residents in the Western Ward of the Moorable Shire, they'll be voting for their council representative for the first time in 24 years. Councillor Tom Sullivan has stood unopposed in every election since 1996. Marco Holden Jeffrey reports. Located just 80 kilometres from Melbourne CBD and half that from Ballarat, Mirable Shire Council is one of the state's fastest growing municipalities. Yet while settlements like Bacchus Marsh and Balang grow rapidly, the ward of West Mirable is still mostly home to hobbyists and potato farmers. The limitation has been on the the growth in the towns has been no sewerage and that's been a sort of holding the back, holding the communities back for the township for growth and council has been promoting that for some time to uh, get sewerage into those areas. Tom Sullivan has represented West Mirable for the past 24 years. His family have lived in the area since the 1860s and even have a local road named after them. People say, oh, you've been on council and got the road named after you. I said, no, the road name came before I got on council, so I, I can't take credit for that. Councillor Sullivan was first elected in 1996 and has stood in the ward unopposed at every election since. But discontent across the Shire has seen a record number of candidates nominate for this year's election. A controversial plan to dump toxic soil dug from the Westgate Tunnel in the Shire has Mirable residents up in arms. The state government is considering the disused Mattingly Brown coal mine as a site for the PFAS contaminated soil. In response to this and a slew of other issues, 20 candidates have put their hand up across the council's four wards. People are angry. Um, they want to see something done. Um, also with lockdown, possibly people have had more time to think about what they want to do in the future. Do I want to make a difference in the community? In West Mirable, Councillor Sullivan's first challenger in 24 years is Lindsay Waters, a university training specialist running on an environmental platform. Maybe, you know, I'll, I'll be humiliated. You know, maybe I'll have my tail between my legs at the end of the uh, election, but I'd love to just give the option to voters, if they're environmentally minded, of someone else to vote for. Tom Sullivan is happy to be challenged, but isn't quite ready to hang his boots up. At local government level, it's a, it's a contest of ideas and that, and I think that's really what it comes down to. But um, I think it's it's healthy, and I think that's something that everyone reached that point themselves when they say, look, I just need to step away now and hand the baton over to someone else to take over. And 
And I guess at the end of the day, when you do leave, and I guess it happens to all of us, you hope that you've left the place a little bit better than when you came on council 24 years ago. Reporting for RMIT Newsline, I'm Marco holden Jeffrey. Now to international news. Madeline Spencer joins us now. Madeline, China's coronavirus cases have dropped off dramatically since the start of the outbreak. What has sparked the new spread in Qingdao? Yeah, so Elsie, um, 12 new cases have, um, been, um, have been found in Qingdao, particularly around the hospital. Six of these are asymptomatic cases. Um, the hospital there has been treating infected travellers from overseas and is located in um, an isolated location. So um, just to stop that spread a little bit more, all cases are either patients, healthcare workers or family of healthcare workers. I see. And the Chinese government's response has been quite similar to Wuhan. What are they planning to do to curb the outbreak? Yeah, so um, similarly to Wuhan, they are planning on testing all 9 million residents um, in Chungdao. The hospital itself has been locked down and buildings where infected residents are living have also been locked down um, as new containment measures. This um, outbreak came after Golden Week which is a holiday um, in China where it's very common to travel domestically. And so um, since then, several cities, um, including Beijing, have put an advised travel have advised travelers to avoid unnecessary trips to the city. Really interesting. And moving on to the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has just announced a new tiered lockdown to be approved in Parliament. What do the measures entail? Yeah, so this new lockdown um, includes shutting pubs, restaurants and bars that don't offer substantive meals in areas that are in a very high alert. So one of the most mo notable areas that is in a very high alert at the moment is the Liverpool area. And um, in that area, gyms, leisure centres, casinos and betting shops there will also be closed. The British government website explains that people living in high risk category areas must not meet with anybody outside their household or support bubble. They also won't be allowed to meet in groups of more than six outside and have been advised to walk and cycle um, in those groups where possible. London at the moment is currently still only in the medium level of restrictions um, and they are meeting, um, their only real restriction is not to meet in groups larger than six indoors and outdoors. Schools, universities, places of worship can remain open. Weddings and funerals can go ahead and all business venues can continue to operate, but must be closed between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. I see. And with the UK on Monday recording 13,972 13, new coronavirus cases, what have been the response to these new measures? Yeah, so this um, patchwork system, as it's been labelled, has been... Um, Lots of people have been finding it quite confusing and hard to follow um, which areas are under which restrictions and what those exactly mean. Ministers have also criticised it for not being enough given how high the infection numbers that they're seeing are. Welsh ministers also are wanting to impose travel bans on areas with the highest infection rates as well. Okay, and moving on to Russia. Earlier this year we heard the, of the poisoning of Kremlin critic Alexei Nalvani. What has been developing on this story? So yes, we've heard, all heard of that poisoning story um, at the moment of a um, opposition to the Kremlin. Germany and France have been leading a response in the EU to impose sanctions on those responsible for the poisoning. They say that there's no credible explanation from Moscow about why the presence of the banned Soviet era nerve agent Novichok um, was in, found in Mr. Navalny's body. So um, they're hoping to um, to, fight, to sanction those Russian agents who are uh, responsible for that. There's broad support among 27 foreigners foreign on several Russian GRU military intelligence officials. Thank you so much, Madeline Spencer, for that update. And we'll now we'll take a quick break. See you shortly.
Welcome back to Newsline. I'm Caitlin Cassidy. Jake Pike joins us now with national news updates from around the country. Jake, Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews has announced a new strategy to help struggling students across the state. Can you tell us a little bit more about the plans? Well, Caitlin, the plan is to invest $250 million in education in 2021. Um, and the way that they're doing that is through basically investing in 4,100 tutors for 200,000 students across the public sector and a further uh, $30 million spent on tutors for the independent and Catholic sector. Now, it's only been a few days since students across the state went back to the classroom. So is this $250 million funding for all students or is it targeted at at a particular group? Well, the, the funding itself is targeted for students who are disadvantaged during lockdown. So there was a number of uh, effects put into place, like giving students laptops, dongles, extra resources, that sort of thing. But unfortunately, we know that students did still fall behind. So any, any student that struggled with technology uh, could be something to do with their home life, or it could have just been their learning needs weren't met while they're in the difficult position of being at home. Hmm. Now, across the border, the Queensland state election is coming up later this month and opposition leader Deb Franklington has found herself in the spotlight. Can you tell us more about that? Well, Deb attended a dinner with real estate mogul uh, Nick DeLuca and what, what's a little bit dodgy here is that eight people from dinner donated $28,000 afterwards towards her campaign. But then, I mean, politicians attend fundraising dinners fairly frequently. So what was the issue with this one in particular? Well, like you said, fundraising dinners are fairly common, but the issue was this wasn't an official fundraising dinner. This was just a social visit. So Deb insists that it wasn't a fundraiser, but a party have referred her to the election watchdog for investigation into the issue, which is very, uh, it's, it's odd considering they're only two weeks out from the election. We'll see how that one pans out. Of course, one more politician under fire today is New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian. Yesterday, we reported on the bombshell revelation of her relationship with the disgraced former MP Daryl Maguire. So what's been the fallout on that today? Are you with us there, Jake? Oh, sorry, Caitlin, what was that? I lost you there for a moment. Uh, just asking about the fallout from Gladys Berejiklian's uh, bombshell reports yesterday, today. Yeah, so there's been strong words from the opposition leader, Jodie McKay. She's called for her resignation and says that she shouldn't walk into Parliament today, which, which she did. Um, she believes that Berejiklian turned a blind eye to corruption. And, you know, there's, there's a little bit of hostility in the Parliament, which, you know, which, which occurred because of these allegations. Mm, and I mean, she has denied she's done anything wrong and tried to sort of reframe the scandal as a personal affair. So how do you think she's dealing with that pressure? Well, she was visibly shocked at the ICAC yesterday. Um, we know that she is a deeply private person. So this has shaken her quite a bit. Uh, despite the attention, she did do a COVID press conference this morning and has attended Parliament Question Time today, uh, during which she was hounded quite, uh, quite heavily. But lives to see another day. Well, Jake, thanks so much for your updates there. Now, Madeline Spencer joins us with a sports update. Thanks, Elsie. So in the ninth stage of the Giro d'Italia, Ruben Guerrero took out the win for the EF Pro Cycling, just eight seconds ahead of Jonathan Castro Castrovillo. Portuguese rider Joao Almeida managed to defend his pink jersey in the stage. On Sunday, Australia came close to winning the Bledisloe Cup from their longtime rivals, New Zealand, who have held the cup now for 18 years. Despite trailing at half time, the Wallabies were able to come back to level the score at 16 all. Lewis Hamilton has equaled Michael Schumacher's record of 91 Formula One wins at the Eiffel Grand Prix. In recognition of his achievement, Schumacher's son Mick presented Hamilton with one of his father's old helmets. Australian Daniel Ricciardo also came third for Renault in the team's first podium win since returning to F1 in 2016. Ahead of the Suncourt Super Netball final between the West Coast Fever and the Melbourne Vixens this weekend, Caitlin Bassett, Australian Diamonds captain, has announced she will no longer be playing in the competition. Bassett played for the Sydney Giants but has not received much court time this season since the implement implementation of the Super Shot. 
Bassett has moved to New Zealand's ANZ Premiership competition. In AFL news, Tanya Hosh, the second female executive and first Indigenous executive, was awarded the 2021 South Australian of the Year Award last night. Hosh is the AFL's Inclusion and Social Policy General Manager and was instrumental in securing an apology from the AFL for the racial vilification of player Adam Goods. And in cricket news, Australia is set to play India at Manuka Oval in Canberra tomorrow as part of the men's T20 International Series. And that's the latest in sports. Thanks for that, Madeline. And we'll be back after this quick break. Welcome back to Newsline. I'm Gabriela Samampao. Like many other industries, journalists have been forced to adapt in new ways in order to accommodate reporting in a pandemic. Second year RMIT journalism students, including me, have put together a list of the top pieces of journalism in 2020, which we will be discussing throughout the week. Today, I'll be joined by Stephen Nguyen, Liam Webster McAllister, and Shamsia Hussainpour to discuss five stories out of the 25 which were selected. First, Stephen and I will be discussing the fall of a transportation system in the Bay Area and how climate change is starting to affect something we always see in morning routines, which is a good old cup of coffee. So Stephen, tell me about the NBC Bay Area miniseries named Bart Derailed. What did you like about it? Oh, hi, Gabby. Oh, the absurd situations that the journalists are in. Oh, it's from, from the people with revving chainsaws to people setting themselves on fire. It's almost it's so hard to take your eyes off the train wreck. And when you usually look at an infrastructure story, you usually don't think about chainsaws or being set on fire, or even worse, racism or police brutality. And in the story, Baghdad Shaban 
is the main journalist and he he charismatically talks to the community about their problems and even confronts the leader of BART about the issues that plague the tree. And another thing that was prominent in the story was data. And as a journalism student, that was really interesting to me as I watched this behind the scenes video. Let's have a quick look. The reality that commuters are dealing with is that violent crime has more than doubled over the past few years. And so we thought it was a legitimate question to ask why and what's being done about it. And not only do we have the video to back it up, but there's also data that we've crunched. And then when you compare the amount of violent crime on BART with other major transportation systems across the country, we have a higher violent crime rate here in the Bay Area. And that's compared to cities like New York, Atlanta, DC, LA. And what we looked at was how often there's violent crime per million rides. And so when you do that math, you find that the rate is actually higher here in the Bay Area. And so that's the very stat that BART itself likes to brag about. They say, listen, we only have four violent crimes for every million rides. And the reality is I learned from your series is that the rides are like upwards of 400,000 per day, right? Yeah, more than 420,000 rides on BART every day. So you're talking about four crimes in two days, potentially. Ultimately, by their own statistics. That was a quick taste again of the miniseries BART Derail. And this, this scene showed me the importance of data in a journalist's toolkit. As being a second year journalist, we are studying the ins and outs of data and how to use it to enhance our stories. And obviously, it's not as as exciting as confronting a leader of, Matt, of Barrett, but it, was, it has become the heart of the story, having shocking revelations and even allegations against the company. So how do you think reporting about local issues like this has changed since the pandemic? Have you seen something, any changes like that in evident in the series? Yes, there's a lot of impact that Corona has on uh, bar derail. And it's the consideration of those places and spaces that they occupy. As lots of people are at home and the Zoom calls are, are, done, are done remotely and there's a lot of focus on the economic impact on bar. So thank you, Stephen. These are really interesting stories and it's amazing to see what journalists are capable of doing despite the restrictions. We'll be taking a break now.
Welcome back to Newsline. I'm here with Liam to discuss an emotional episode of a video series by the AFL named The Last Time I Cried. Shamsia Hussainpour will be joining me after this to talk about a coal miner's daughter who came top in Afghanistan's university entrance exam. But first, we've got AFL's The Last Time I Cried. So, Liam, why did you choose this particular episode as one of the best in 2020? Hi, Gabby. Well, AFL's series Last Time I Cried is a nine-part series with nine different AFL, AFL personalities where they discuss the last time they cried. This particular episode covers Western Bulldogs former football star Tom Boyd. This was a, a major news story at the time and people were very unsure what exactly was going on. But this episode does a great job to explain exactly what happened. And it made people stand back and reflect on how everyone has their own personal struggles. Let's take a quick look at an extract from the story. When you put it all together, we had an unbelievable girlfriend I'm going to marry in a great house, in a great country, healthy, earning well, sport I love, cannot feel worse about myself. Where am I? But this is the whole point, isn't it? It's not, it's, it's, it's not, no one is immune and it's not proportional to your life. Some of the most powerful, brilliant people in the world have had so many issues in this area. We lose one every year. That was an extract of AFL's The Last Time I Cried. So as we see, it's really heavy on emotion. So Liam, what does it tell you about the world of sports right now? Yeah, well, the, my first reaction to the story is just how shocking it really is. And you have to stand back and consider the message of the story. And I think it's all about breaking stereotypes, not just in sport, but for all professions that people get stereotyped for. And one of the big things to consider was Hamish McLaughlin's presence in the story. He's quite reserved. He doesn't speak much and it allows Tom Boyd to really tell his story. And there's a really heartwarming moment towards the back end of the story where Tom Boyd and Hamish McLaughlin are sitting on the floor, no longer reporter and talent, but simply two men having an important conversation. So how do you feel about being a student journalist, particularly one that's interested in sports during these times? Well, it's very difficult. I think obviously we all, us, all of us students would like to have been at campus using expensive equipment. But unfortunately, we're having to work from home, but it's, you know, teaching us to be intuitive and do with what we've got. Um, and on a personal level, I've been working on a podcast and also doing final series previews on the Swanston Gazette. Thanks, Liam. That sounds great. Last but not the least, Shamsia joins me with a story by The Guardian about a coal miner's daughter coming top in Afghanistan's university entrance exam. Hi, Shamsia. Why do you think it was so important to tell Alazada's story? Hello, Gabby. Thanks for having me. So personally, as a young Afghan woman, it has given me a lot of hope for women in Afghanistan. It's extremely important for me in the world to celebrate and tell her story because women in Afghanistan have been limited to their rights and opportunities. So accomplishments like this are huge, especially when it comes to an ethnic minority woman and in the field of education. So the, the celebration comes at a sensitive time as the government holds peace talk with the Taliban who have been oppressing women for decades. That's interesting. So in the story, Alvada said that she won't let politics stop her from studying. So how did her passion and just the story as a whole inspire you? Well, as an Afghan myself, uh, you know, born in Afghanistan, Afghanistan has been a it has been through a lot for many decades now, but seeing such a positive thing for once brings a glimpse of hope for um, its people. So, you know, when your rights have been challenged and when your voice has been uh, silenced and you left with no choice but, but to rebel against the oppressors. And Shamsia has done exactly that. She is a symbol of hope for Afghan women and a hero for those who stand against oppression. And hopefully her success changes the way a woman is treated and perceived in Afghanistan. Thank you, Shamsia. We've got quite a lineup of, of this year's best stories for you to check out after this program. Thanks, 
Gabriella, Liam, Stephen and Shamsia for those stories. In breaking news, a building has collapsed at Curtin University in Perth. At least one person is feared dead. Emergency services are attempting to rescue others from the rubble. In local news now, while some of us are looking forward to hopefully stepping out of our five kilometre radius next week, hundreds of Melbournians remain in no hurry to leave their suburbs. A boom in roller skating has seen local stores selling out of stock, while nostalgia-hungry skaters carve laps around their suburbs. Reporter Sophie Rayner asks if there's something more to this lockdown trend. As millions of Melbournians started lockdown in March, we looked for a way to fill in the time. Many of us found roller skating. The 70s activity has peaked in popularity during lockdown. Online searches have quadrupled and stores are reporting record sales. But why skating? And why now? I have a sense that we look for things that bring us comfort and bring us joy um, because the world is pretty scary at the moment. It's very um, unstable, it's very unpredictable, and so we look for those things that are familiar. Alex McLean ordered her roller skates after watching videos of the defiant, body-positive Moxie Girls skate crew from Long Beach, California. Everyone's reactions when I told them I bought skates, like my family in particular, were like, what have you done? What have you done? She says it's more than a way to spend time outside. It's a foundation for confidence, self-acceptance and nourishment. I hope that one thing coming out of lockdown is that it's shown us what's really important to us. So like we've been doing scrapbooking as a house as well as like things that like roller skating. Um, and they're activities that I want to keep doing post lockdown. Like I want to have more calm and peace in my life. While skaters like Alex hope to hold on to the good they've gained from their lockdown hobby, others wonder whether skating's really here to stay. I do think it's quite symptomatic of the moment that we're in currently, which is to say that perhaps it won't continue because people won't you know, be confined to a five kilometre radius. They won't necessarily have the sense that they have extra time on their hands because really we have no extra time in our days. We still have 24 hours in a day, but we have a feeling of having extra time on our hands because we can't go overseas or go further afield. We can't see our friends so much. Um, so I feel that perhaps when that sense of having extra time dissipates, then maybe the roller skates might slowly start to just sit in the hallway. However much our enthusiasm wanes, the skating trend may signal a new appreciation for comfort, fun and joy. I'm Sophie Rayner, reporting for RMIT Newsline. And now to Nick Zimbulis with Finance and Weather. Thanks, Caitlin. The Australian share market is on track to record a seventh consecutive day of gains for the first time since June. The ASX 200 jumped by as much as 1.2% to reach 6,200. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 300 points as tech giant Apple surged 6.4%, adding $128 billion US to its stock market value. Both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ have recorded their best week since July, with S&P gaining 57 points and the NASDAQ adding almost 300 points. The Aussie dollar will get you 72 US cents, 61 euro cents, 55 British pence and 5 Japanese yen. In the commodities market, gold is worth 1,915 an ounce. And oil prices are steady after the return of supply in Norway and the US Gulf of Mexico. You're now up to date with the latest finance news. Now to weather from Melbourne and around the country. We had a mostly cloudy day in Melbourne today with some morning fog in the outer suburbs. Some sunny breaks this afternoon. The city reached a top of 16 degrees. Around the rest of the country, Darwin was sunny today, reaching a maximum of 35. In Brisbane, it was partly cloudy with a top of 28. Sydney had, a pl had plenty of sun today, reaching a maximum of 27. Canberra hit 25 degrees with a sunny morning, but a chance of thunderstorms this evening. Across the country, in Perth, it was mostly sunny today, a maximum of 29. Adelaide was sunny with a top of 26 degrees, and in Hobart, mostly sunny and 15. For the week ahead, Melbourne is looking cloudy with more rainfall as we approach the weekend. 
Wednesday will be partly cloudy, 25 degrees. Showers increasing on Thursday with a top of 25 degrees. Showers continuing into Friday 19. A rainy weekend as well. Saturday will have a shower or two, 21 degrees, and Sunday, showers and 19. That's your Newsline weather. I'm Nick Zimboulos. Back to you, Caitlin and Elsie. Thanks, Nick. Thank you so much. The stigma around mental illness in regional and rural areas can make it harder for people to access mental health services. With restrictions still in place, one organisation is encouraging regional Victorians to use art and creativity to improve their mental health. Madeline Spencer reports. The state government, in collaboration with the DAC Centre, have created online art workshops to improve mental health in regional and rural areas. The DAC Centre, which aims to destigmatise mental illness through art, is offering workshops in October. So one of the big main aims is to create connection and conversation for people um, living in um, regional areas so they can connect with each other through a great medium like visual art, um, have a chance to you know, share stories about their journey. Participants need no previous experience and are able to use materials around their home or send a pack of art supplies in advance of the workshop. This year, the federal government has made 10 additional psychological sessions available to Victorians until March 2021. However, Charmaine says that regional areas often lack mental health care specialists and struggle more with the increased stigma around mental illness. It's really important in regional areas for us to create safe spaces to have conversations about mental health. And I think art is one, one way to have that safe space. There's many different ways. Artist Emma Cornwall returned to her home in Thorpedale during the first lockdown. She says her art making has benefited her mental health immensely. Something that's been like incredibly helpful for me during lockdown is not like focusing on the outcome, but like thinking about being in the moment and in the practice. And in that way, I've not been so concerned with like an unpredictable future. Like a lot of people felt like I had no control over the situation. And I think that comes with a lot of feelings of like anxiety. Um, so I think, having art there for me in a way that I can be free in my expression, but also have control over, um, you know, you know, manipulating the material and things like that has been really helpful for me. While the state continues working towards a COVID normal, the DAC Centre encourages Victorians to embrace creativity. If you feel an urge to create or want to create, like just, you know, just, do it, pick up a pen, pick up some paint, um, create some space for yourself. There are just so many benefits um, to being creative. Madeline Spencer reporting for RMIT Newsline. And that concludes today's Newsline program. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Caitlin Cassidy. And I'm Elsie Lange. We'll be back on air tomorrow. See you then.